The hosts feel it would be a little unkind to present this podcast without just a word of friendly warning. We are about to unfold the story of Frankenstein, a man of science who sought to create a man after his own image without reckoning upon God. It is one of the strangest tales ever told. It deals with the two great mysteries of creation, life and death. I think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. So if any of you feel that you do not care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to. Well, we've warned you. Hello, and welcome once again to the Frankencast. I'm the mad scientist, Anthony Bowman. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm joined as always by... The 70s prog rock version of the old guy from Family Guy, that is Eric Velasco. <laughs> so pronouns are also he, him. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is a good... <laughs> right? Nailed That's it. That's a good comparison, yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yep. Oh. <laughs> so we're obviously talking about long legs this week. Yeah, yeah, we, you know, we mentioned, I guess, you know, it's been a couple months ago that, you know, that, I guess, uh, Oz Perkins, the director here, had, like, mentioned that this was, in some ways, inspired by Frankenstein, so, of course, we had to talk about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, let's talk about the the relation to Frankenstein. It's kind of tenuous, kind of not. I mean, there is a connection, for sure. Yeah, and I guess we should say, you know, like, as, as we normally do with, like, new release kind of oh, things, yeah. we're going to kind of discuss vaguely at first, and then we'll get into, like, heavier spoilers here in a little bit. Um, Absolutely. But, yeah. yeah, yeah, I, like, I get where he's coming from with the Frankenstein thing, but it is it is definitely one of the less Frankenstein-y things we've talked about on the show. Absolutely. I mean, there's there's a supernatural element that definitely has little to do with Frankenstein, or maybe it has everything to do with it, depending on your point of view. Basically, it has something to do with dolls. I'll say that. That's not mm-hmm. too much of a spoiler. Um, geez, what else? What else because <laughs> right a lot of it's going to be spoilers, for sure. Yeah, yeah. This movie, you know, I mean, like, when you come, when like, I, I feel like that's the thing that this movie did really well, was all of the promotional stuff, all the trailers and everything, they were really compelling and interesting, but did not give you really Spoil any anything. information. Um You know, especially with, uh, you know, I I try to go in pretty blind with horror movies if I can. I usually avoid trailers altogether, but uh, Long Legs definitely did a good job of, you know, not doing... Like, um, one of the trailers uh, before, you know, my screening was was for Cuckoo. I don't know if you had that trailer as well. Yes. Uh, Did you also have 20 minutes of uh, solid commercials for Neon? Neon Yes. (laughs) Yes. So many trailers. Mm Mm-hmm. And Cuckoo looks really good, but I feel like that trailer said a lot. Like, it, yeah. it told a lot of what was going to happen in the movie, which is annoying. Yeah, um, and I think, well, the name kind of gives some of it away, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, um, we're pretty but, sure we know. I'm going to still see it. It looks good. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. But, um, yeah. But, yeah, this one, you know, like, with it being, like, you know, what you do know before going in is that there's, you know, it's a serial killer story. It's a police procedural kind of thriller. Something with families. Yeah, definitely in the vein of, like, Seven or uh, Silence of the Lambs, mm-hmm. things like that. Um, so there's definitely things to spoil. You know, there's a mystery. Um, less of a mystery than you'd expect. A lot of it is given away early in the film. Um, right, as it but goes. it doesn't really hit home until they drive it home at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get into spoilers, just in general, like, how did you feel about this? Okay, when I walked out, I will say I had mixed feelings, for mm-hmm. sure. <sighs> I I enjoyed ninety five percent of the movie. Yeah, like it was it was pretty solid, and like when it hits you at the end, it hits you hard. Mm-hmm. Now the ending was kind of frustrating because I was like, there's a number of ways you could avoid it right now if you tried <laughs> it, but maybe maybe they wouldn't have worked. Who knows? Uh, and then the final the final scene uh, involving the main villain, I was I was like, eh. <laughs> like the very last scene. I'm not talking about like right before when everything goes to shit. Mm. Like, yeah. Too much Nicolas Cage can be a bad thing, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I, d- I definitely, like, I, I think I've been kind of, like, reading a lot after watching it and seeing what other people are saying about it and everything. And it seems like there are some people who are just like, this is the best movie I've seen this year, uh, you know, possibly in, in many years. And then some people are like, wow, that was a letdown. And I, I, I feel like I kind of fall in between. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't, I don't think this is the scariest movie I've ever seen. It's definitely, I don't think it's the best movie I've seen this year. I saw, no. I saw the TV glow yesterday and I think it's much better. Yeah. Uh, but it, it felt like, it's a tricky line to walk when you're doing something that is police procedural, you know, mystery based. And Mm -hmm. then you also add in supernatural supernatural elements Mm -hmm. because obviously you can't like we as viewers can't solve a mystery if, if there's supernatural elements in it, because that's not our real world experience, you know? Um, So I don't know. I felt like there, there is a way to do that. I think it's just harder. And I think, this could have been better if it had, I, I don't know, the, like the, the without spoiling things, but like the thing at the end, what we find out is actually happening. I, mm-hmm. I, I was a little underwhelmed by it. Yeah. Like I, I would have liked a different direction there. Yeah. Um, the acting is great. Was... It looks incredible. Nicholas Cage is, you know, well cast as this weirdo. Uh, but yeah, it just felt like it didn't quite come together at the end the way I wanted it to. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean. So I do, here's something that I'm going to say, and it may be controversial or may not be, but I think this will be a cl- considered a classic later on just for the simple fact of the style that it brings, mm-hmm. the look that it has. Um, I think this is rewatchable for sure, mm-hmm. even knowing the ending. Uh, yeah. Just because of all the tension that's built up through the movie. And it is released. And mm-hmm. that, you know, that's a good feeling at the very end. Yeah, it- I would like this movie is heavy on vibes and a mm-hmm. little light on plot. Yeah. Not, not. I mean, it, it has a plot. It definitely has. A, but like, if you're somebody who loves like just you know unsettling, creepy movies, this definitely delivers on that. It is Absolutely. uncomfortable all the way through. Uh, there's there's a weird tension just uh, between like and the, it makes the acting. so much sense at the end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I and I feel like so I remember when I saw Hereditary. I'd heard all this buzz. It's super creepy. And then I went in and I was like, this is not really a horror movie. It's something else. Yeah. Uh, and, and I kind of, I did not like Hereditary in the theater. And then the next day I kept thinking about Hereditary and kept thinking about it. And then when it came to video and I watched it again, I was like, okay, yes, this is incredible. And yeah. maybe this will have the same impact on me over time. Right now I'm still kind of like processing, but I, I, I think Hereditary is more successful than Long Legs, uh, yeah. currently at least, that's how I feel. But I, I agree with you. I think this is a movie I will definitely rewatch, and I, I hope that, you know, after knowing the twists and knowing where I'm going, that just like the general vibe will kind of present differently to me. Yeah. Um, and also there's a lot of things that, like this is not a movie you put on in the background. No, right? definitely not. You're paying not. attention to everything because it's, it's important. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, yeah. even, let's say you, this, I guess you could put this on at a Halloween party if everyone has already seen it, but yeah. I feel like that, that party would grind to a halt because everyone's just sitting there watching it like, what the, <laughs> almost like a train wreck in slow motion, right? Yeah, yeah, but it definitely it, it grabs you, like, it's, you know, just the look of it, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know. Well, I, the I, first, the first, like, minute of the movie, there's no way you're going to avoid that. Mm-hmm. Like, once that comes on, it's like, all right, I'm hooked, fuck. Yeah, all right, absolutely. Yeah. So are we ready to get into spoilers? Yeah, yeah. I think that's about as far as we can go trying to be vague because, yeah, there's just too much to, to say about specifics here. Okay. So we're going to open up the movie with a little girl going outside. Uh, uh, someone is talking about a, like a fairy tale story about a, a mother and her daughter being left alone with no family and no friends that ever come to see them mm-hmm. until one day there is. Yeah. Um, and she's got a little Polaroid camera, and she kind of, like, walks out, you know, behind the house. And the camera is child's eye view. Like, we're getting, we're, you know, it's 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 all low shots. And we see mm-hmm. there's a guy, or a person, I guess. You, right. you can't even. It, it's, a, it's a gender ambiguous individual, for sure. Because mm-hmm. I thought it was, like, a, some grandma, and then the mm-hmm. long legs thing would be jumping around, right? I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah, so the the girl approaches this this person and they kind of like they're kind of talking to her and like unsettling you know it's it's they're kind of 
rambling in sort of a cr- an insane kind of way. Right. Uh, I left my long legs at home, or I wore my long legs today. Yeah, which I I'd never heard that phrase, but I've talked to a few other people that are like, oh yeah, my grandpa used to always say that, and like I. I uh, but it, I you know, it's just like a little. He's saying this to a child because, like, you know, adults are taller and like yeah. squats down to be on child level. Like, I'm gonna take off my long legs and get down where you are. And as they squat down, that's when we get like we see their face, and then the, like the camera like cuts away real fast. Like, well, they say they say, what what would uh, what would you do if I did this? And then scream basically screams at the camera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna and learn s- that this is Nicolas Cage playing. Long legs slash, uh, what was their last name? Cobble? Cobble, yeah. yeah. Um, and a- again, so like, Nick, it's Nicolas Cage, but he is heavily and made heavy up. Um, oh, uh, not even, I mean, it's like mask stuff. You know, I mean, it's like thick appliances. You know, it's not just, just uh, makeup on, but like. Yeah, it's like a corrupted version of a doll. Mm-hmm. It's a really strange choice to to do this, and then it not really be like about the plot. Like, like there, it, no one's ever commenting on this strange appearance that this character has. Oh, I think uh, this has everything to do with the plot. Like, because to me, so so here's where I'm coming from. I think that the makeup uh, basically is like this. This may be me adding stuff to it, but he looks like a corrupted angel, mm-hmm. or or a like. Precious Memories doll, right? Yes, so yeah, that's for kind sure. Of what he's what he's doing, and that has an effect on the dolls mm-hmm. later, right? Like he yeah. is one of the his own dolls. Yeah, yeah, he definitely does have a doll. Like, like it, it just, I wonder if like it, it. It seems like it would have been something where like he has done this to himself in some oh, yeah. way, but but like we never, that's never sort of commented on by anybody. Um, but yeah, like you said, it is very angelic. Like, in fact, like he calls the children little angel at, at certain mm-hmm. points, but like, um, he's all in white, you know, it's, it's very like contrasting. Yeah. Like, you know, usually like if you're going to be really obvious about something like a villain is in all, all dark and like, you know, mm-hmm. kind of, but like, this is sort of like ominous in the reverse. Like it, he's, right. he's in like pure white. It's, it's very clean, <clears throat> but in a way that's like unsettling. Settling. Yeah. That's that's the entire act, uh, acting choice for Nicolas Cage in this one is unsettling mm-hmm. for sure, mm-hmm. and it, it it benefits the movie. Like this is when uh, letting N- Nicolas Cage out does work. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Until he goes a little bit too much Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Uh, okay. But yeah, so that kicks off the movie. Then we're brought into a uh, Agent Lee Harker. Uh, is it a spoiler to say that you know? This is the older version of the girl because it's literally 20 years later. Yeah, it, I mean, like, I thought it might be, but it, it takes a little bit before it fully spells it out. But, yeah, I mean, like, right away I was like, I think that's what's going on here. Yeah. Um, so Micah Monroe is immediately playing, or Lee Harker, is immediately unsettling in herself in that she's not exactly, it's like something crawled inside human skin, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's very low on emotion. Like, she's just a very, like, even-keeled. Um, I think she's kind of autism-coded a little bit. Like, yeah. she has trouble interacting with people. There's a really great scene with her with a kid that I was like, oh, man, this is speaking to me a little bit. Um, yeah. But, yeah, she's just uh, a little bit, you know, like, uh, again, uh, like, a lot of people will, will call autistic people, like, robots. And she definitely has that kind of, like, slightly robotic vibe to her. Right. Um, Which there is a thing, uh, there's a reason for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we won't hear about that till way later. But yeah, we've got her and a partner and they are investigating. Um, Agent Fisk. Uh, mm-hmm. They're investi- investigating a murder and they're like in this just like subdivision, like a, a really like just standard issue suburbs, a bunch of houses that look identical and they're supposed to be like canvassing. So they're knocking right. on doors, asking if people have seen things. And then suddenly she kind of like, almost glitches out and is like, wait a minute, that the house. Ki- that's the killer is right there, right? Yeah, and well, her... Also, like, this is very much like Silence of the Lambs, right? To a mm-hmm. point, she's a... She's a... I wouldn't say redneck, but she has a southern accent to her mm-hmm. voice. Yeah, yeah. She's channeling uh, Starling, for sure. Mm-hmm. And it almost seems like some of the agents are like, oh, she's just a, she's just a woman. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think they do a lot to diminish her in like uh, like so that people are underestimating her. And I think yeah, female FBI agent is already like people are going to be like not listening to her as much. But yeah, I think the 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 slight southern accent is definitely like people still kind of think of you hear that accent and you think that's not a very educated person and that's right. obviously incorrect. Um, but you know, I, I think it's definitely, it sets her up to be underestimated. hundred mm-hmm. percent. And, uh, well, agent Fisk opens the door and, uh, starts going into a spiel and immediately gets domed to the head. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm not calling it in on a hunch, but we right. can go knock on the door and maybe we'll find something out. Yeah. And yeah, like she's she's like around a corner, so she sees him get shot, but the person who shoots him does not see her. Right. Um, so immediately we get the end of, ending of Silence of the Lambs, where she's chasing the guy through the the dark uh, house, right? Yeah, and yeah, at this point I was like, damn, like this movie is getting crazy really early. Like we have yeah. the the weird, scary, cold open. We have this, um, you know, it, it's it's like intense right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. Um, she catches the guy. He's mm-hmm. he's literally just sitting on his bed with his hands up. Mm-hmm. It's just a normal yeah. dude. Yeah. So she's being tested after, like, uh, they're asking her, they're, like, showing her pictures and having her do, like, a word, word association. association. Yeah. And then they start asking her to guess a number that has been generated by, a, like, a random g- number generator. Right. Um, and then immediately we're brought out, and there's Agent Carter and Agent uh, Browning. Who's mm-hmm. in the front seat of the car, and they're like, Agent Carter is like, you guessed better than fifty percent on most of the questions. How did you do that? How did and you pull like, that off? And she's like, well, you know, I mean, I also got fifty percent of them wrong, and he's like, yeah, no, but that's like, that's <laughs> that's way, a way above average. That's not how how this goes. Yeah. Well, I feel like fifty fifty should be, you know. Well, may I guess there's a lot of numbers, right? She yeah. has to choose zero between between zero and a hundred inclusive. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, like because of her really good, uh, you know, guess um, about the the uh, the previous killer, and then you know, passing this test or whatever, she's or kind she's of being, yeah, yeah. Like they they're like she has some level of clairvoyance, so we're gonna put you on the case that we've been working on for decades and been unable to, to figure anything out. Um, right. It turns out there's been a lot of family murders. Yeah, but they're very strange because everything about them appears to be a murder-suicide where a dad kills all of his family and then kills himself. But at, at all of these crime scenes, they find a note written in a cryptic cipher signed right. by Long Legs. Hmm. Um, and they're all the notes are written in the same handwriting, and it's not handwriting matching anybody involved in the case, any of the, the dead the or, yeah. Uh, but they don't have any other kind of DNA evidence. So, who is writing these notes? How are they respond? How are they getting the fathers to do this? Mm-hmm. And you know, how are they not leaving any other evidence behind? So right. we immediately get a Charles Manson reference in that. You know he's he's guilty and he's in jail at the time, uh, mm. but he didn't he didn't actually do it. He had accomplices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So w- yeah, there it's it's almost you know I mean it's a a mystery that already is like this seems impossible. What what could happen that that could cause it this? Make any sense? Hmm. Um. And you know so they kind of like leave Lee to to work. They like put her in this room. They give her all the case files. She lays stuff out on the floor. Um, I think there's a, a scene where she just like falls asleep, and like yeah. you know her uh, Carter comes in, and then you know is like, He's like wakes let's her go up. get a drink. Yeah, she has figured a bunch of stuff out just looking at all the case stuff that like somehow no one else has caught, and none yeah. of this seems clairvoyant. This just seems observant. She well, realizes she really she cracks it open here in a minute mm-hmm. because she gets help. Yeah, yeah, but at this point she realizes. Every one of these families had a nine-year-old daughter, daughter. Um, and the daughters were all Birthday. born on the 14th. Um, of, of each individual month. Mm-hmm. And but the murders happened six days before? Or within a six-day window on either side of the, the girl's birthday. Yeah. Um, and in fact, when Lee writes out all of the dates and, and does it, like, it forms like a triangle. Um, and, you know, of course... She's looking at like occult books and seeing like you know upside down triangles as being like an occult symbol, you know, right, connected like to like six 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 on every 
flat side. Yeah, and like she's got like the the Lucifer sigil that has like a bunch of triangles in it, and, you know. So mm-hmm. she's looking at all that. And she's like, it seems like whoever's doing these, they're they're telling a story. They've got some sort of ritual they're working on, or or they're trying to send a message in some way. So right. she can kind of predict. Like it looks like this is you know these dates we're getting to. That's going to be the the final. Uh, you know, I, I think it's like there's one date left that that is coming. Right, and this is this is the uh, the whole satanic panic thing, right? Mm-hmm. This is where this is coming from. This is er, what early '90s, so this is uh this is right when it's coming to its uh, crescendo. Yeah, I I think this movie is probably it's like '93 would be my mm-hmm. guess. I don't know if they ever say specifically, but we see in every government office we see um, framed pictures of Bill Clinton hanging up, yeah. like. Uh, it's obvious, so he's, yeah. yeah, he's definitely the president at this point in the film or, yeah. you know, at this point in, in time. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I would say early 90s seems likely. Yeah, 100%. But, yeah, so uh, at the end of that scene where she's figuring everything out, or at least part of it, um, that's when Harker busts in, asks her to go for a drink. She responds with, uh, I don't drink. And he's like, well, I do. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm going to drink, and you can tell me what you figured out. So. Right. And yeah, they, they go, go to a bar, and, and yeah, she tells him all of that. And um, then uh, he learns, oh, shit, uh, I was out drinking too late, so uh, I'm going home, and uh, you're going to meet my family. <laughs> yeah. Because I don't want to be accused of anything, right? Right, yeah, and, like, I, you know, I, I can't, obviously can't drive. So she drives him home, um, and, you know, it is, it's, I think it's, like, midnight or something, um, mm-hmm. and when he gets there, he's like, oh, no, all the lights are on, I'm busted, uh, so, you know, they go inside, uh, Lee gets to meet his wife. She seems very reasonable. Like, this is not like a scene where she's like, where have you been? Or anything like that. She's just like, oh, hey, you know, and he's like, I want you to meet my partner on this yeah. new, on this case or whatever. And the wife's, you know, n- like polite and everything, but also his daughter is still awake and she's like, you know, nine or something. She's, she's, she's young. Um, and, yeah, and she's <laughs> like, Hey, I couldn't get anything to eat because, uh, you were late. And he's like, well, it was past your bedtime. So <laughs> yeah, you should be asleep. But, um, so we somehow, got a nice, happy family. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they all seem to, to get along. It's, it's a, it, they have like a very sweet dynamic. There's no real tension there. Um, and underscore the, it'd be a bad, it would be terrible. If something were to happen to them. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and as, as kids are wont to do, the daughter is like, Oh, here's a new person. I don't know. Let me show you my room. And she just drags Lee back to her room. Um, and this is this is the scene I was talking about. Like Lee definitely does not know how to interact with children at all. Well, they both uh, sit on opposite sides of the bed, just and Lee's like, "So, um, yeah, okay. Do you <laughs> yeah. like dolls?" <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the the daughter, I think her name's Ruby. Yes. Um, she like invites Lee to her birthday party that's coming soon, and Lee's like, uh okay, yeah, I guess I'll come to your birthday party. Um, and I think that at that point, Carter comes in and is like, we better, Ruby, it's time for bed. We better send Lee on her way. Oh, by the uh, way, I don't think we mentioned, like, did we mention that Lee Harker is played by Micah Monroe, who I think is going to go on to do a lot of good things. Blair Underwood is Agent Carter. Michelle Choi Lee is Agent Browning. Uh, Dakota Dalby, Agent Fisk. I don't know if he's really, <laughs> you know, that... Uh, we're, yeah. And, uh, we'll, we'll talk about Alicia Witt because we're going to get a phone call from her as, uh, Lee's mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lee ends up leaving and, uh, you know, leaves Carter and his family, uh, goes back to her house, which is like a cabin in the woods. Yeah. Like, you know, everything about this movie feels very like, uh, it, it seems more like it's in like a city, but like she feels very out in the middle of nowhere. She's um, removed from everything, right? Yeah. And she's, she's, so this is where, yeah, she talks to her mom. She calls her mom on the phone. And, and her mom says something like, have you, are you still saying your prayers? Mm hmm. Her mom, it's very, it's weird. Like the conversations with her mom, it feels like neither one of them knows how to talk to each other, but like they also feel compelled to like keep like having these conversations, you know, like they, right. it's like they love each other, but they don't know how to say it. So they just have these really awkward conversations. Like and talk there's frequently. been, there's been a, a break in the family at some point. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it seems like she's the ultra re- religious type, which honestly, a lot of things in this movie is a reference to other movies. 
So this <laughs> this feels like her and her mother are a reference to Carrie. Later mm-hmm. on, we're going to have a strong phantasm. Mm, like yes. Yeah, yeah, there is definitely, like, Carrie vibes for sure with her and her mom. And I guess the cabin kind of reminds me of uh, the Strangers. Mm, yeah. Especially with the home invasion that's about to happen. Yeah, so, like, yeah, while while Lee's on the phone, she starts hearing sounds. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, it is not, and, but so she, like, you know, gets off the phone with her mom, like, I'll call you back later. there's a weird ominous shadow in the background. (laughs) Yeah. Hmm. So she, you know, ends up, like, walking around the house. I think she even, like, goes outside um, mm-hmm. just trying to figure out what that what sound she was hearing. That's when we see our good friend in uh, acid wash denim walking mm-hmm. through her house. Yeah. She runs back inside, and, you know, he's gone. Like, every, you know, the house is empty, but there has been uh, a note left at her desk where she was working and talking to her mom. Yeah, it's a birthday card that says, do not open till January 14th. Mm-hmm. Her birthday. Yeah. <laughs> but of course she opens it right away. Um, and yeah, you know, like you said, it's a birthday card. It contains some of the cryptic, like, you know, cipher lettering, but it also has, it's like got the translation right underneath it. Um, yeah, it's the key. It's the key to the cipher. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, of course she starts getting to work right away with this new bit of information. Um, now, why and, on earth would the killer give her the key to the cipher? That's silly. Yeah. Why would you do and, that? And it also, Wink. in the card, says something along the lines of, like, if you tell uh, if you tell anybody about this note or, or like, how you got this, this key, does, is, does it threaten her mom? Is that what the – like, there's some kind of – I think it's, like, I'll kill your mom if you uh, – I don't. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember that because I was probably paying attention to all the other stuff that was going on. <laughs> but there, there's something along the lines of like you can't tell yeah, what don't, about do this. Do not tell anyone about the. Yeah, um, and so that that leads into her talking to Carter the next day, and she's like, "I've translated all of the ciphers from every right. one of the killings. I got it all figured out." And he's and like, he's like "How did you do that?" Yeah, and she's like, "I just looked at it long enough." And he's like, "Okay," yeah. which like it looked to me like. If somebody had spent the time with those ciphers, they probably it. I mean, it, it, it's one to one. It's it's right. each symbol stands for a letter. For it's a nothing, letter. nothing super complex. It seems like the FBI would have already figured this out. But at okay. least one cryptographer should have gotten close, right? Mm-hmm. But in you know, it, in the end, you know, yeah, it, it's Lee, I guess. So she mm-hmm. she figures it out, um, and they start you know reading through all, all of the stuff she's translated. And it leads them to the camera house. Hmm. Uh, this is a, a, family, a family, one of the families that you know had this this stuff happen to them. It's like but, the first one, right? Yeah, and the weird thing about the the camera family is it's the one time that there was a survivor. Um, right. There is a, a young she's daughter. She's catatonic. Yeah, she's sense. she's been in like a mental health facility and hasn't spoken or you know just kind of has has been. Uh, you know, yeah, catatonic ever since. Um, mm-hmm. But they're like, there's got to be something about this house. Like, we should go out and, and look at the crime scene again. Yeah, and they do. They go out to this old farmhouse. They find this... She, uh, Harker is drawn to this barn mm-hmm. instead of the house. She's like, mm, we got to go in there. So there's something in there. Yeah, and, and of course, it is led right to a spot in the floor where Don't she... Don't they walk past a goat? There's so several times in this movie in the background you will see like a a black silhouette with like goat horns that in this case may be an actual goat because they're on a farm but like mm-hmm. there are other points where it's there's like in a house and stuff and it's definitely like it's just like split second shots where it's like oh the you know like the devil's here or something like you know there's just yeah. like it does a really good job of being kind of like just ominous and putting little things in the background like that almost um, subliminal images right mm-hmm, for sure. Well, they uh, they find uh, they go up to the loft and Lee's like it's something. There's something around here. Mm-hmm. And so they yeah they end up pulling up a bunch of floorboards and inside they find like it looks like a person. Right, like but, a person like bundled up, right? Mm-hmm. But when they get it, it it's a it's a doll. It's a life size child Life-like doll. doll. Mm-hmm. Like I'm pretty and, sure there was an actor or actress in that thing. <laughs> and it, yeah, it's 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 right on that like uncanny valley line. Like it it looks it looks very real, but it also looks very fake, fake. at the same time. Like it's it, it's uncomfortable looking at it. Almost like you put a mask on a person. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, very similar to the the makeup that that Nicolas Cage's character has. Exactly. Um, but it turns out this looks exactly like Carrie Ann Camera, the lone survivor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do they find the orb, or do they? Does the medical examiner end up finding the medical that? examiner opens it up and is like, "Hey, there's this orb," um, and they're like, "Okay, cool. Well, like, so if we crack it open, we're gonna find out what's going on, right?" And the medical examiner's like, well, we've already kind of done an x-ray, so there's nothing inside the orb. It's just mm-hmm. an orb. It's yeah. a hollow orb. Yep, just a metal orb. I think, is this what you, the phantasm reference you were thinking of? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, it, um, and there, there's a really great ga- like joke here. Like, it, it, I don't know how it was it when you saw it, but like, the theater just cracked up at this. Because um, like, the, the medical examiner's like, yeah, the orb, it's weird, like... Every time I touch it, I feel like I hear this like ominous voice whispering my ex-wife's name. Name, but like <laughs> yeah. definitely that couldn't happen. I mean, that's not you know that's not real. <laughs> yeah, it's weird, weird you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought that was pretty good. But when Lee touches it, we we get like these really quick flashes, flashes of all kinds of like violent imagery. You know, it's just uh, so fast you can't even really tell what you're seeing. But um, basically, murders, right? Mm-hmm. The family murders. Yeah. Is this that we get like a scene with Lee and Carter? Like, so what the fuck does all this mean? What is what's? Mm-hmm. Um, well, then they get a call. Hey, uh, it's really weird. Well, I, I'm pretty sure this is where this happens. Uh, that Carrie Ann camera girl just woke up. Oh yes, yes, yeah. Um, so they end up going to try to like talk to her. Right. Um, and we have a great scene with the uh, the admi- the. This guy is like the sleazy guy from. Uh, Silence of the Lambs, right? The the mm. guy who ran the but this this guy's just incompetent versus a scumbag. Um, where Harker's like, all right, cool. Um, so do you have like a registry? Do you have like all of his information or whoever? Sh- there was a visitor. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you, Harker was like, did you get his information? Did you get his name? You know, did you get a copy of his photo ID, which you probably should at this time? <laughs> and the guy's like, no, but that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we probably should do, should do that, but we don't. Right. <laughs> um, but but we do have a, a sign in sheet, and so he gets it out, and he's like, "Okay, it was this, and the the the, the name is Lee Harker." Harker, and she's like, "Fuck," you know, like, yeah. yeah. I didn't um, do that. I wasn't here. Yeah. Well, Agent Carter is like, mm, "Where are you?" Like he starts <laughs> casting suspicion on her. Yeah, there's there's an interesting like. You know they they brought Lee Harker onto this case because they knew she had this these clairvoyant abilities, right? Uh, but but the question much, is, is she setting this up now? Yeah, like quickly Carter starts kind of like distrusting her and even like distrusting her abilities, and it's like you brought her on for this. Like this is yeah. she wasn't seeking this case out. She didn't claim to be clairvoyant. This was all on you guys. Um, and and suddenly he's like, I don't know if that I believe this voodoo shit and stuff. Um, yeah. So they do end up going in and talking to Carrie and Camera, who's and, creepy as shit, played by Karen and Shipka, by the way. Yeah, which uh, I know she was in the Black Coat's Daughter that Oz mm-hmm. Perkins previously did. Um, but yeah, she's so good in this, and it took me a while to recognize her because she's just doing such a weird thing. Like she, well, she's also uh, Sabrina, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, but. She, you know, she like in this. She's just suddenly like completely cogent. You know, she's she's been catatonic all these years, and now she well, can just like. She's also she, kind of speaking in riddles, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they Talking keep trying to get information from her, and she's like, you know, not being very helpful at all. Well, she even says at some point, she's like, "Yeah, it felt like whenever this was happening, it felt like somebody was strangling me." You know, like I could and telling me to strangle you, or I could strangle you. Mm-hmm. I could just jump over and choke the life out of you. Yeah, and I'd be if that's what he wanted me to do. I'd be happy as peaches to do it. Do it, yeah. She keeps saying happy as peaches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she's got a real, you know, very southern kind of accent here. Um, yeah. uh, very folksy. Um, so they end up leaving her. Like you know, they don't really get much out of her. So they they leave. Um, and this is, I think, when Carter and uh, Lee really kind of discuss everything. And, and Lee thinks this must be the thing. Like, there's there's a matching doll for every girl. And I don't know what that has to do with the killings, but, like, that's got to be the catalyst in some way. Maybe right. the orbs have something to do with it. Who knows, right? We, yeah. We haven't figured it out quite yet. 
So let's go. Uh, let's go visit mom. Let's go see what mom's up to. Yeah. So you know, Lee checks in, and her mom. The house is like it's not quite like full on hoarder house, but it's close. It's pretty like close. It's, yeah. It's very cluttered. Um, you know, it's not. Like I feel like when it, uh, the thing that like sets hoarders apart is it's usually like it it becomes like gross, you know, like there's yeah. like disgusting things, trash. When they and start stuff. hoarding animal bones that have uh, still have a bit of meat on them. Yeah, this I'm is, not ta- I'm, talking down to the goth girls out there who collect bones. <laughs> so don't worry about it. You you usually clean yours off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In this case, I mean, there's definitely a ton of stuff everywhere, but it's like it doesn't seem. It's untidy, but it's not unclean, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Right. Um, it's on the borderline, though. It's getting there. Mm-hmm, for sure. And it's kind of reflecting the mother's mental state because she's, as Harker goes in, her mom's just sitting on the edge of a bed watching TV. Mm-hmm. And her hair is kind of disheveled. It's long. It's not. It's like she doesn't take care of herself or kind of does. Kind of yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah, she definitely seems kind of out of it. Uh, you know, again, going back to those awkward conversations they had on the phone, like they're just, they're both a little off. And whether that has to do with uh, genetics, maybe, you know, or if it's like a thing that happened, which, you know, we'll, right. we'll get to some of that a little later. But like, right. she, well, she turns and asks Lee, hey, do you still say your prayers? Echoing earlier. Mm-hmm. And Lee's like, no, mom, I don't say my prayers. They scare me. Which, yeah. That's a and weird it, thing to say. It definitely is, yeah. Um, and her mom's like, well, yeah, you know, I, like, it, it, they don't really matter. Like, it, <laughs> Yeah, they don't do fine. shit. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right, we, the weird, but okay. All right, I get you. <laughs> yeah. um, so Lee ends up going up to her childhood bedroom and, like, kind of digging around her old stuff. And she finds at the bottom of a toy box a stack of Polaroid pictures. Yeah. Uh, and, you, you know, we mentioned earlier that at the beginning of the film, the little girl had a Polaroid camera. But uh, then she finds one in particular of the, the individual's lower half of their face. And she's like, that, that's mm-hmm. the one. That's the guy. And she suddenly kind of remembers this encounter. Like it was kind of, you know, the thing with like traumatic memory sometimes being blocked or whatever. Um, which especially during satanic panic stuff, that was a big thing. This idea of of people suppressing memories and stuff. I think now a lot of that's discredited for the most part. People can't really suppress memories. They can forget things, you know, or like they can disassociate for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, this definitely fits in with the tone and the setting of this movie that suddenly this, this memory comes flooding back to her. Um, and she gives, so she takes the picture and, and like, you know, gives it to Carter and is like, this is our guy. We, we like, um, and then it just kind of like, I don't know how that picture would really solve anything. It's, it's an, it's a blurry Polaroid that's 20 years old or whatever. Um, but like we, uh, well then we, we pretty- cut to, we cut to our long legs person mm-hmm. driving in the car, going to do their errands in a bathrobe. Yeah. And he's like listening to prog rock and like singing along in the car. Um, At and the top it, of his voice in the shrill. Yeah. yeah the, the only kind of singing you do when nobody's looking, right? <laughs> right. And there is uh, like, you know, you kind of com- called him up. Like the, uh, the movie, the very first thing we see is actually a quote from the band T-Rex. Right. Um, and, and when we've seen Long Legs, like, room or whatever there's like posters of t-rex on the walls and like i think like he's he's into this sort of like 70s prog kind of thing and you, you know he's kind of dressing in, in that way well um, it's literally lyrics from um which which song was it it's their own like their only famous one what is that the the main song i think of from them is that like get it on bang a bang gong, gong song but it's not that one it's this and i don't even remember the lines it was but it was just kind of vaguely ominous you know kind of set the the stage for the the movie basically talking about putting uh, their teeth into little girls mhm yeah. yeah um but yeah so as he's driving along he's suddenly surrounded by cops coming at him from both directions and just pulled over oh no 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 he goes into the this is when he goes into the oh right uh, he go <laughs> He goes to that that little general store and like has a really weird interaction with the like teenage girl behind the counter. Right, but she's like, "Dad, it's that weird stinky guy again." <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, as we've kind of mentioned, like there's a very androgynous quality to to this to, to long legs. You mm-hmm. know, he's got long hair and and the weird sort of uncanny valley face. 
is sort of feminine. It, it kind of looks like an old lady. It kind of looks like a, a you know a grizzled man. Like it, there's just it, it doesn't seem like a ra- like a real person. You know, right? Um, Seems like a doll. By the way, it is uh, those lyrics are from Bang a Gong. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, interesting. I, I would do- look that up real quick. Gotcha. Okay, and I don't know. It feels like it's strange that you know. I mean, she says that creepy guy, but she no one ever really seems to comment on the fact that like you don't look like a real person. Like you right. look uh, like you've been modified in some strange way. Well, um, it, it seems like this character has like a, almost a shield around them, right? Mm-hmm. That's just barely protecting them from the outside world. Yeah. Um, and I, I have seen some people commenting that like there's something about this movie that feels a little transphobic um, hmm. in that like there is this weird androgynous figure that is villainous and sort of grooming children in some way. Um, I can definitely see that interpretation. I don't know that that was like the intention of, of right. the, you know, of Oz Perkins and the, the, the creators, but I, I can definitely see where like it, it feels like a, you know, the, the trans villain is definitely like a, a trope and, and this kind of like borders into that. But since it's never really commented on and it's never like part of the story, it's hard to say really. Like, you know, if, if, you know, if you had like one of the detectives like making a joke about like, I can't tell if you're a man or a woman or something right. that might like push into that but, more. But it's like, they can all tell this is a, this is a male character. Yeah. Everybody calls him a man. No one ever comments on him being anything other than that. Right. Um, he's just, he just looks strange right and wears effeminate clothing Mm -hmm. which you know being like t-rex you know that like this seems like prog or like you know it's it's a style choice that feels very like 70s 80s like rock band so yeah uh, glam rock almost right on the yeah absolutely for sure um and so is it yeah is it once he leaves that he ends up like getting surrounded once he leaves this is this is this is Accurate, actually where she's like no this is the guy i know you know i know where he'll be and so i guess it, it happens. it's a combination of her having the photo and having the clairvoyance that, yes. that like finally leads them to him mm-hmm. um but he's just sitting there with a uh with a suitcase just mm-hmm. ready to be picked up oh yeah that's right he's not even in the car anymore he's like almost like at a bus stop or something like and yeah, yeah they just surround him and he's just like puts his hands up and just goes quietly no resisting no fight he he's just ready like like you said he he knows this is getting ready to happen and he's ready to go yeah like something told him mm-hmm. and we do get shots of the uh where his lair i guess you would call it mm-hmm. it's definitely in a basement and there's always like a shot of the uh like almost a hallway that's overly dark. It's darker than it should be with all the lighting going on. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, a layer is a good name for it. It just looks, it looks like a, like a grimy, like teenager's basement, you know, like there's just, you know, like T-Rex posters. I think it's like a Lou Reed poster. Just like a bunch of, uh, you know, like it doesn't, it doesn't overtly look serial killer ish. You know, it's not like there's like, you know, usually it, it, when you're trying to like portray that, like, you know, something like maniac or something, there's like usually like tons of like naked women posted everywhere or something like it's just like, yeah. uh, or some sort of deranged collage. This doesn't have that kind of quality. It's, you know, it, it does it, kind it, of almost feel like Buffalo Bill's uh, dressing room. Mm, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely Sounds. Buffalo Bill qualities to this this character as well. Right. Without um, expressly going trans. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. Now that I'm thinking about it, there's a lot of overlap, especially Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I get I get where you're coming from with the the possible Yeah, it's like I don't think it's heavy like it's not really really overtly that, but like, mm-hmm. you know, if you're going to uh, there could be some like subconscious stuff going on in here that that Especially if you're a trans critic or a, you know just a trans viewer, you, pick up on. Y- you might yeah it might feel a little bit more present there. Um, so once they they have long legs captured, uh, you know Lee can kind of continues her investigation stuff and she's looking at her triangle and is like, well we see we see the the video interview of long legs. Mm-hmm. Oh and yeah, we yeah, have that's like on settling. Mm-hmm. We have like all of the the pol- you know they're like in the sort of like bullpen or whatever. All these police watching this, you know, on like a you know a, a little video AV cart, you know, watching this interrogation that is super unhinged. He's like singing at part of it. 
Well, um, he, he says, yeah, pretty soon we're going to have a big birthday party. And it's going to be for Agent Lee Harker. And you'll be there. And you'll be there. <laughs> and then she kind of looks like just off, or he looks off the camera and goes, and you'll be there. Special, or especially you'll be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really, and like, he, does is, does he start singing happy birthday? Is that yes. how it? Happy birthday, Lee Harker. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, the, the, uh, commander like pauses and pauses it at a, a great frame where like Nicolas Cage looks creepy as hell and so he's just in the background the rest of it just like you know glaring at them um, right almost like he's looking through the screen at the audience right yeah and Lee you know Lee's like so how long does and she's like oh it goes on like this for, for another minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah he's just it just gets worse and worse like you got the, you got the gist of it though <laughs> right uh, but basically he's, he's decided he's not going to tell anybody anything else Except for you. He wants mm. you in that room. Yeah, you got to go in there. Um, and Harker wants to talk to him because she's now convinced, after looking at the triangle and the dates and how everything lines up, she thinks Longlegs has an accomplice still out there. So they yeah. need to find out who that is. And maybe maybe uh, Longlegs will tell her. Right, exactly. So let's go do the interview. A scene <laughs> that will always be burned into my head. Yeah, yeah. This scene is definitely one of the best of the film. It's it's really creepy. It's it's uh, yeah. It's just really. It's I really one really good thing with like police procedural thriller scenes uh, or interrogation scenes is when you have someone who looks like they should be you know like he is captured. He is in jail. Yeah. He's being interrogated. He it seems He's like still he a should threat. Yeah, like he he's got the upper hand in this scene, even though it, he shouldn't. Uh, and there's something so good and just ominous about that. Yeah. So basically, we we go in, he, like he he immediately starts singing "Happy Birthday" to Lee, mm -hmm. which that's fun. Yeah. Right? Um, and you know she's asking, you know she wants to know if he's got an accomplice, and you know obviously he's he says he works for or, or serves. Um, the, the man downstairs. Right, you Mr. might even downstairs. call him Mr. Downstairs. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and, you know. Gee, I wonder who that is. <laughs> right. She's asking about who is your accomplice? Like, who did it and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, what is it that he ends up coming back with? I forget exactly the, the phrase. But yeah. basically, you should you should call your mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, check in with your mom. That that might be a good lead for you. Mm. Um, and then, like, he ends up... The interview ends with him just yelling, like, Hail Satan over and over well, again. Yeah, as he smashes his face into the uh, steel table. Mm -hmm. Nobody stops him. Yeah, and, like, they, this <clears throat> scene... Like, it looks good. Like, he beats the hell out... Like, his, his nose is gone. Like, it looks skeletal by the end of it. It almost um, seems like, like, at this point... He served his purpose and was getting ready to spill, spill a little bit more than he should have. Mm -hmm. And then it, it's almost like somebody was taking his head and slamming it into the table. Uh, yeah, definitely. That was the motion. Yeah. Um, so, you know, after that weird interaction and, the, the you know, him talking about her mom, you know, Lee obviously speeds to her mom's home. Um, well, with... she goes there with Browning. Browning's like, hey, listen, I'm going to take you there because mm -hmm. you obviously have just seen some fucked up shit. Yeah. So let's go talk to your mom. Yeah, so uh, they they get there and Browning stays in the car, um, and Lee like Lee goes talk to her mom. Yeah, she runs inside and she doesn't like the everything's just slightly off in the house, but she doesn't see her mom. Like she's trying to find her, she's like yelling for her, running through the house and everything. She, yeah, she doesn't. She, is it this time or earlier uh, that she has the vision of her mom running and grabbing like a rifle? I, I think that's here. Yeah. Yeah. She touches, uh, like, a, a, a broom or something in the house, and it reminds her of her mom grabbing a rifle. Mm -hmm. But that's all we see is just the mom grabbing the rifle yeah. as the door is open. And Lee is going, like, deeper into the house. And then, like, we cut away from Lee and back out to um, Officer Browning right. sitting in the car. And right behind and we her. See right Lee's behind mom. her. See, yeah. She's walking up to the, uh, to the driver's side door with a gun. Yeah. Um, and Fires just, one shot. Yep. Just kills Browning. That's um, weird. Why is her mom killing people? Why is she dressed like a nun as well? That's weird. <laughs> right. You know? Uh, yeah. So I, Lee obviously hears that and, like, rushes out. 
Right, um, as her mom circles the car again for the f- the kill shot or making mm-hmm. sure that she double tapped her. Yeah. So as Lee gets out there, her mom now has um, a doll that looks like the girl from the beginning, you know, right. young Lee. And the doll is like standing up in the middle of this sort of field, um, which means, I mean, you know, it's a doll. She had to like position it like that. And she's like standing away from it with her shotgun or rifle or whatever. Like, put, put, um, put the gun down, mom. And mom's yeah, obviously, she's out of it now. The mom's mm-hmm. like definitely out of it. She's like, I'm going to set you free, Lee. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh no, is she going to wheel on her daughter? She shoots the doll in the head and blows its head apart. Mm-hmm. And we see a black smoke. Yeah, this weird smoke coming out of the doll as Lee just like collapses to the ground. And it kind of looks like there may be some black smoke that leaves Lee's Her. head as well. Yeah. Um, but she wakes up and she's in Longlegs' lair. Like she's in the exact same room as Longlegs was. Yes. So that's obviously, uh, you know, starts to connect a lot of dots here. Like, right. She uh, starts figuring out. Or we're, this is what she has a vision of uh, what? Of the other family committing the murders? Mm hmm. Yeah. Where the dad just runs up on the mom with an axe and butchers her, then butchers a priest, and then I think finally kill, kills the daughter and then himself. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. But it's like it, she's seeing it from the doll's point of view. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So there's obviously we're seeing a lot of connections here and everything. Um, and we, we finally get that, like, so when Lee was a kid and saw Long Legs, um, he returned that night and was going to do, you know, begin this, this whole process. He was going to, uh, kill Give her for, birth. yeah. Um, but Ruth make, made a deal. Uh, Lee's mom made a deal with, uh, with long legs that she would help him with as this. long as her daughter was allowed to grow up. Mm hmm. Um, so that's why there's a missing date in the triangle is, is where Lee should have been. Right. Um, exactly. And so ever since then, uh, long legs has operated out of yeah, Lee's we, base. We find out Lee, Lee comes out. Yeah. He was in her mom's basement the whole time. Yeah. So she spent her entire life growing up with this serial killer, Satanist weirdo in her basement, and she never knew it. Um, So here's kind of what I'm thinking. Like, it's almost like he's her estranged father mm -hmm. to a a degree. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, obviously he's the symbol of Satan in the movie. Mm -hmm. He is sort of Mr. Downstairs. He's literally living downstairs downstairs from her. Yeah. Well, that's uh, until we actually see Satan appear. <laughs> right, it won't be long. Yeah. yeah. But in his lair, he makes, you know, he's custom making these dolls. Um, and so this is when we start to, like, fill in a lot of the blanks that are, like, this is uh, this is where it's, like, if, if you were supposed to be a viewer following this and figuring it out, no yeah. one is going to guess satanic doll with, you know, a, a magic orb infused with, uh, you know, Satan's power inside. Well, we, won't, like the, we won't get the full reveal until she starts talking to her mom when her mom mm, spells it out. Yeah. Because it's, guess what? It's Ruby's birthday and it's the 14th. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so this is why Ruth dresses as a nun. Like the whole, the whole thing is long legs makes a doll with these magic, you know, influences inside yeah. them. And, and I forgot that one of his lines is, Congratulations! You've, you're a big winner from the church. Here's a gift from the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So Ruth gives the doll to the family, and then things go from there. By the uh, way, who like? I know my mom wouldn't have done this. Like my mom wouldn't have just been like, "I don't go to that church. I don't want that fucking doll. <laughs> get get out of here." Right? Yeah, it's it's like one. Yeah, I mean, taking I just a random. Yeah, I mean, maybe, but it's like. If if so, if someone showed up at my house with a doll that was a perfect recreation of my child, I don't care what the backstory is. That's fucking weird. You yeah. you made a doll like how did you know what my kid looked like? Where are you fo- you know like are you following this kid like unless you you know if we attend a church and they're like hey we you know we had this artist do this, yeah, but like if no. a, a stranger no 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 I don't I don't know what's going on with this doll, but I don't want it in my house. Yeah, I we, we destroyed. Didn't, we didn't- Maybe it's because of the, my redneck family, but it's like, we don't go to that church. We didn't enter no contest. We don't want nothing you got. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but apparently in this case, it's working. Um, yeah. 
A lot of people uh, accept the doll. Mm-hmm. Well, also, does, uh, doesn't does he say uh, you either accept the doll into your home or you 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 burn? Mm-hmm. Or maybe that's what the mom says. Yeah, so she's like, the satanic influence and the connection between the doll and the child, this is kind of like where we figure out, like, okay, so this is why Lee has been clairvoyant all these years. Right. Because the doll... Because the devil's did, telling her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they didn't go through with the, the murder thing, she's still tied to this doll all this years, uh, which is why the mom said, I'm going to free you when she blows up the doll's head. Yeah. Uh, disconnecting Lee from this whole narrative. Yeah, the evil influence. So mm-hmm. she, once again, she, you know, understands that her mom is the accomplice. Uh, she knows that she's gone to Ruby's house. So this is when we get the big final confrontation. Yeah, Lee she, busts in. Oh, sorry. Well, she gets a phone call at the house, and it's like a creepy voice that says, That's right. you're late for Ruby's party. Yeah. And so she, you know, hang, hangs up and, like, rushes out. And, she, like, that's when she's like, oh, shit, it's the 14th. And, of course, you know, we knew that Ruby's party. birthday was coming up for a while. So, like, obviously, all this birthday stuff, of course, this is where it's all going to culminate. Listen, if you're going to show us a family, uh, there's a good chance that family's going to get torn up at the end. Yeah, obviously, we, you know, if you hadn't put the pieces together, of course, this is where it's all going. Um, Lee speeds off to get to Agent Carter's house. Um, Agent Carter's like, hey, or she goes there and Agent Carter's like, hey, come on in. It's Ruby's birthday. mm -hmm. We're getting ready to cut the cake. Yeah. Um, And so we get this scene of like, or when she goes inside, her mom is there Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a doll of Ruby. That Ruby's Um, lovingly stroking on. Yeah. So everybody's just sitting around in the living room. Lee has a seat. It's very tense and weird. Well, the Uh, mom's like trying to cry and like trying to say something, but it's almost like something shutting her up. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And there's like a, we need to go get a knife to cut the cake. Of course. And the dad's like very agitated. He's like, of course I'm going to go. Or Carter's like, I'm going to go get the cake. Um, That's what you do with the cake. You cut the fucking cake. Yeah. And the mom's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll go in there and I'll help you. And uh, we'll be right back. And and Carter's like, no, I'll be right back. You're gonna, you're not right. gonna leave the kitchen. And Lee, Lee's almost goes to help her, but her mom's like, she's already dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So yeah, of course. So Carter and and his wife leave the room. Um. And so yeah, when he comes back in, well, he's got mom a- spills the be- beans. She tells her everything. Mm-hmm. She's like, yeah, basically, he was going. He had me tied up. He was going to kill me. And then kill you. That's when I made the deal to so that the little girl could grow up. By the way, she's half out of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, ever since then, I've been bringing these dolls into houses. Once they get into the house, that's when the spell takes effect. The father will then kill the mother, then kill the child, then kill himself. Mm-hmm. In that yeah. Order. Yeah. So, of course, you know, here, this is the last one. This is the, or, and I think Carter or Lee asks her, like, wh- you know, when does this end? Like, you're, are you blackmailed for the rest of your life doing this? Mm-hmm. And it, she's basically like, you know, I have to do it until we earn enough points, basically. Like, yeah. otherwise, we're going to be tortured in hell forever. Like, this, this is, is the last one. This should yeah, be it. This, this finishes the triangle. Right. Well, you know, she. this is when mom's like, no, the little girl has to grow up. She has to receive the doll for her birthday. And Lee is getting ready to try and stop her. Uh, that's when the confrontation comes. The mom comes out with a knife, getting ready to stab Lee. Mm-hmm. Lee shoots her mother, killing her. Mm-hmm. And that's when Carter comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she ends up having to shoot and kill Carter. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, she uses, then... uh, three bullets on him. And mm-hmm. then she's like, oh, I can stop this with uh, shooting the doll. And she takes it, th- takes three shots, but none of them go off. And that's when we see the devil, <laughs> like actual, like <laughs> outline of the devil. Yeah. And it's like the way, you know, I, I don't, I don't think she has fired enough that her gun should be empty. It and shouldn't. when she, and when she's firing, it's like, you know, usually if you fire, cause it's a revolver. And when you fire an empty revolver, the, you know, the, the revolver part revolves, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that's, it still clicks around and tries to find an, you know, but hers doesn't really. It just kind of like it seems like it kind of like twitches, but it doesn't actually turn over. So it's almost right. like the gun is jammed in some way. Well, it's like the devil's holding the cylinder, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, 
and that, that that was one thing that was really frustrating me at the end is like she could have saved Carter and his wife by shooting the doll, but then it's like, oh no, the devil would have definitely stopped her there. Mm-hmm. She probably would have died. Yeah. So that we end with her just like frozen, holding the gun, and we hear Long Legs singing "Happy Birthday." Yeah, I could have done without this. Like literally, just her holding the gun with Ruby loving on the doll mm-hmm. would have been a great way to go out. Yeah, but yeah, him singing "Happy Birthday." It's like so he's sort of still around in some way, or it's just you know like. <sighs> It's, well, he won. This is his victory lap, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So whatever the devil is trying to accomplish and whatever, you know, like, it's, yeah. We don't we don't know what comes next. The movie kind of ends on the, you know, uh, it's not an abrupt ending, but it's kind of a... Cliffhanger. It's leaving a lot for us to guess what happens next. Is yeah. this, are, you know, is this like the, the cabin in the woods ending where, like, we've unleashed the apocalypse? Or is Lee uh, going to have to pick up the bag where her mom left off? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's... And I, I do... I mean, I appreciate that ambiguity, leaving that, like, oh, there's so much still left unsaid, so much that that comes next, and we don't know what. Um, yeah, it just... To me, I don't know, like, I wish that the answer had not been magic orb inside doll head. If there had been right. something else, some other explanation... Um, maybe there's some other supernatural angle that would have worked better for me. And, you know, your mileage may vary here. Like, this might work for some people, but, like, uh, I don't know. I just felt like... It felt like a cop-out for it to be like, we're talking about satanic panic, and then it's like, oh, but actually, yes, it really is... really is Satan. (laughs) This this time, you know, like, uh, it's... uh, You know, as we often say, the devil from the Bible (laughs) here in this... Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, I don't know, like... I don't know what the answer would have been, but I, that was that was the thing that I was just like, oh, if it had stuck the landing better in some other way, I feel like this would have been like a 10 out of 10 movie. But like, as it is, it's like, I, I don't know, like a six or a seven out of 10 for me. Like it's, it's not bad and I, it may grow in its esteem for me, yeah. but yeah, it's just like the, it's all vibes. And then when it gets to this like big conclusion, it just, it didn't Flops quite work bit. for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so here's kind of my take on it. I think to a degree they were trying to make the devil from the Bible uh, a Lovecraftian entity almost, right? Because there's an investigation, there's madness, uh, there's really no rhyme or reason as to why he's targeting th- those families. Just he is. And that's that's a weird thing, right? Like, why would you, why? What's the reasoning, you know? Mm-hmm. Does that get him more souls? Well, what do those souls do, right? Right, yeah. So it, it just opens up more questions that this isn't even going to come close to answering. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm right with you. Six is probably pretty good. Yeah. I, I definitely think it's worth seeing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like, it, it seems like a, a lot of stuff I'm seeing is either people being like, best movie ever or trash. And I really don't think either one of those are accurate. I think no. I think this is trying something really interesting. It's doing it in a very beautiful way. Um you know, I mean, like, I feel like when X came out, everyone was like, oh, wow, if you shoot with, like, grainy film stock, right. it looks so cool. Like, and this and is, it does. That, yeah, this. and this is similar. Like, it's, it's, it just looks, it looks great on the screen, you know, mm-hmm. um, but, but yeah, it's just, yeah. I would say if you're looking for vibes only, if that's all you cared about, this is mm-hmm. 10 out of 10 for sure. Yeah. Now, if Absolutely. you're looking for deeper that's where, yeah, if you look deeper, it starts falling apart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just, it, it's tricky, you know, like I said at the beginning, like, when you're doing something that is a police procedural mystery, uh, and then you shift to supernatural, it just, it's hard to, like, bridge that gap. And and mm-hmm. it it feels like that was where the, the movie kind of fell apart, is, like, if you can't follow along and solve the mystery as a, as a viewer, you know, then... It, it just it's it's just missing something there. Um, yeah. It would almost have been better if we never figured it out, and it just was like Lee had to go and try to solve this, and bad things happened, but it just kind of ended, uh, and we never knew how they happened. Right. Well, I mean, heck, even if let, let's say there was the shot with the doll, and then Lee wakes up and gets the phone call, right? Maybe end it there, and you've mm-hmm. auto- automatically got a way better movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, just well, yeah. 
just because it shows you kind of what happened, but not everything. And it still lets you ask and answer those questions yourself. Yeah. Yeah, like that, you know, the ending is kind of ambiguous anyway, and that would have made it more ambiguous, but in a way that I think would have made me want to chew on it more and sit and think about it and watch it again and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so. you know, still definitely worth checking out. Just, I think that, that people kind of like deal in extremes when they talk about mm-hmm. movies anymore, and it's okay for there to be a movie that is just like, okay, this is, it's fine. It's trying something. It may not have nailed it, but like, good for it for trying something. 100%. Yeah, I mean... Like, the fact that a movie, everyone feels like a movie has to be perfect, or it's a complete just waste of time, it's it's weird, right? You can mm-hmm. experience things in the middle. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, this show's very mid. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So I think that's all I've got to say about this. It's I don't want to beat it to death since probably a lot of people haven't seen it, but yeah, definitely check it out. Um, whether now in theaters or when it hits streaming or whatever, it's, it's worth a watch. And yeah, I think it probably does benefit from theaters um, just because the sound design, the look of it, mm-hmm. like, you get all the detail, right? And you get that out of regular TVs as well or modern TVs now as well. But I feel like at home, uh, I don't know. We'll see when it comes yeah. out. Yeah, it, it does look great on the big screen, and I know that when it comes out on you know streaming, I will definitely watch it again and kind of like yeah. reevaluate how I feel about it. But hundred uh, percent, yeah. All right, Anthony, it's the uh, almost the end of summer, so uh, we haven't done a lot of swimming. <laughs> so maybe next week we can go to Frankenstein Island. Yeah, yeah. This is this is one um, that has been kind of on our radar to talk about for a little while. Um, if you have watched or listened to all of our episodes, you might know we possibly might have a special guest next week. Um, you know, you can, we'll leave it at that. And if, if you know, you yeah. know. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll be talking about Frankenstein Island, which I know is, is, it's one of those that's kind of in the classic range that people talk about a lot, but I have not seen this one. So I'm, I'm excited. I hear it's kind of weird, but uh, we like weird. So I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. This will be a new one for both of us. So let's get to it. All right. Well, I'm, we're going to go out on this. <clears throat> well, you're dirty and sweet, clad in black. Don't look back and I love you. You're dirty and sweet, oh yeah. Well, you're slim and you're weak. You've got the teeth of the Hydra upon you. You're dirty sweet and you're my girl. <laughs> and to be continued. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you survived another episode. The Freaking Cast is a production of FCR Media. It's hosted by Anthony Bowman and Eric Velasquez. Follow us on Twitter at The Freaking Cast or send us a letter at thefreakingcast at gmail.com. Our cover art is by Amanda Keller. You can find her at Keller Illustrations on Instagram. Our theme music is by Vivek Abhishek. Thanks for listening. <laughs>